I do want to thank you all for coming. I know everybody is busy with all kinds of things. So thanks for taking the time out. So what I want to do in this lecture, because in a certain sense, the lecture has two purposes. On the one hand, to introduce the topic Jews and race, and particularly the way I'm interested in trying to um, navigate this very complicated question, and also a question that's extremely relevant to, uh, to our time, certainly in the United States, but I think also in Israel for different reasons, which I will talk about a little bit. And second of all, to kind of, you know, make a sales pitch for for people to enroll in the course and to attend the, the other four lectures. So toward the end of my remarks today, which I'm, I'm not going to extend more than 40 minutes, I do want to go over at least the topics for each of the uh, 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 four subsequent lectures for people who are interested in in taking part in this. I decided for this lecture that I'm not gonna use any PowerPoint. For the other lectures, um, I will use PowerPoint. We will actually be reading text together and hopefully have the opportunity to send some text out to the participants in advance so they can read them. So the question of Jews and race. I wanna begin with a, a quotation um, by Aleph Beit Yoshua. For those of you who don't know, Aleph Beit Yoshua is one of the great living Israeli writers and poets. And in a, in a lecture or in an essay, a lecture that then became an essay in 2005 called Who is a Jew? Yoshua said the following, Jews are not a race and never considered themselves as such. It's a fascinating line and in a certain sense, I can say the entire course is gonna be a way of unpacking and and showing the complexity and also ultimately I think the falsity of that claim but let, let's take this let's take this line this one line Jews are not a race and never considered themselves as such so there are two claims being made here one an objective claim and one a subjective one the objective claim is obviously that Jews are not a race the subjective claim is that they never viewed themselves as such. Now, the first part of the claim, the first part of the sentence, basically requires us to understand what Yeshua means by race. That is, before we can understand if Jews were a race, we have to understand what the category of race is. When does race begin to be a way for people or peoples to identify other peoples and for peoples to identify themselves. Now, traditionally or conventionally, I would say, when, when, when somebody, you know, if somebody would ask you that question, an, an obvious answer would be that it begins sometime in the 19th century with the emergence of race science in Germany, where the idea of race became a way in which peoples were defined. Other people like Gerald Horn in the dawning of the apocalypse, uh, the, root of, the roots of slavery, white supremacy, settler colonialism, capitalism in the long 16th century argues that in fact, race begins not in the 19th century, but actually begins in the 16th century with the beginning of the slave trade in Europe in particular, that also includes America, where the concept of whiteness, the whiteness of the European was formed and constructed as the antithesis to the blackness of the Africans who were being sold into slavery. So Horn says that actually race as a category, maybe not a scientific one, but certainly as a sociological one begins uh, earlier than that. But of course, Yeshua doesn't tell us what he means by race. Now let's take the second part of the sentence. Jews never consider themselves as such. In some way, um, the 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 more subjective claim would usually be the more difficult one to um, to ascertain or to determine. But actually, in this case, it's just the opposite. The harder claim is the objective claim because we don't know what Yeshua means by race. But the idea that Jews never consider themselves a race is simply false in a, in a, in an absolute way, since we have many many texts where Jews did refer to themselves as a race, and certainly many texts where Jews were considered a race. So where do we go with that? So for example, Menashe ben Israel, 
in his famous letter to Oliver Cromwell in the middle of the 17th century, which, which was a letter um, advocating Jews being permitted back into the British, into, into England, writes that Jews should be allowed back into England because of the, no, and I'm quoting here, quote, the nobleness and the purity of their blood. Now, this idea of Jewish blood is something that the historian Susan Glenn calls blood logic and was used quite often, actually, um, in Jewish history by Jews uh, in order to define themselves as such. In 1916, Louis Brandeis refers to the Jews as the purest race. Martin Buber often refers to Jews as a race. Franz Rosenzweig in his Star of Redemption refers to the Jews as a blood community, right? So we see that the idea of race was not something that was, uh, that was anathema to Jews in terms of a self-identity. In fact, we can go even further and say one way of understanding the discrepancy or differences between the reform movement in Germany in the 19th century and the nascent Zionist movement that starts taking root at the end of the 19th century is precisely on the question of the racialization of the Jews. Reformed Jews generally were um, not sympathetic to seeing Jews as a race, but rather wanted to see themselves as racially similar or identical to their European neighbors. And what is, was distinctive about the Jews was their religion. So some reformers in Germany referred themselves referred to themselves as Jews. I'm sorry, as um, yes, as uh, Germans of the Mosaic persuasion, things like that. Zionists, on the other hand, were much more sympathetic to the racialization of Jews, of the Jews, because racialization was one way of constituting nationalism. Now. We have to think about that in the context in which it was said. If we go back to Ernst Renan's famous lecture, What is a Nation, and essay, What is a Nation, if we go back to um, uh, uh, Herder's notion of nationalism, in the 19th century, nationalism was a racialized category. So it, it seems quite obvious that when the Jews wanted to construct their own sense of nationalism, race became a way of distinguishing them from those people around them. Now, of course, race ceases to be a term that's used to define Jews or for Jews to define themselves, largely in the 1930s when it became the marker of anti-Semitism in, in Nazi Germany. And after the war, the use of the term race in reference to the Jews started to become less and less frequent until it almost disappeared entirely. And I want to talk about the relationship between Jews as an ethnos or ethnicity and Jews as a race. So there are really two questions that I want to deal with in this series. The first one is, are Jews a race? And the second one is, Jews and race. That is, how did Jews understand the category of race, not only in terms of self-definition, but how they saw themselves situated within a racialized society? Now, this second, um, uh, um, this second question, and there's a third question too, but this second question really is much more specific to America, and I'll explain what I mean in a moment. The third thing I want to deal with in this talk, in this series, is, of course, the question of anti-Semitism and its relationship to race. Obviously, or I shouldn't say obviously, the term anti-Semitism is a racialized term, right? The Semite is, of course, the Jew, but yet it is called the Semite. And Semites were, in the 19th century, one of the groups of races among the race scientists. So in a certain sense, Jews were considered to be of the Semitic race, 
which was other than the other racial groups that were in Europe at the time. From our perspective, though, because those racial categories are no longer really operative, it really becomes a question of whiteness and the relationship of Jews to whiteness. And this is particularly true in America, as we'll see um, throughout the, 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 the lectures that we're going to be talking about. But I want to talk about it a little bit, a little bit more now. What is the status of the Jews as a race? What is problematic about viewing the Jews as a race? And what is beneficial about viewing the Jews as a race? Now, there's something actually quite interesting in the way in which the racialization of the Jew becomes a foundation for anti-Semitism, not because, usual, as usually thought, and as is thought later on in later anti-Semitic writings, that the Jews are an inferior race, but rather in the early period of the racialization of the Jew that leads to anti-Semitism, it's that the Jews are a superior race. So for example, you see in Houston Stewart Chamberlain's Foundations of the 19th Century, which is considered to be one of the great early articulations of anti-Semitism, Chamberlain argues that the Jews should not become a part of European society, not because they're inferior, but because they're superior. That is, according to Chamberlain, because Jews did not intermarry throughout most of history, because they're not mixed, right? They actually have maintained a purity of race that makes them stronger. And then it becomes for Chamberlain the fear that if Jews were included to be part of European society, they would dominate that society. And then you have all of the Jewish stereo, the anti-Semitic stereotypes of, you know, Jews running the banks and money and, you know, taking over this and taking over that. Like that doesn't come from thinking that the Jews are an inferior race. It comes from just the opposite. Now, when you move into um, into the later period of anti-Semitism, certainly, certainly in the period of Nazism, it starts to move in the reverse where Jews are considered an inferior race and so on and so forth. We don't have to kind of get into that, but it's just, it's interesting to note that the original racialization of the Jew was one of racial superiority and not racial inferiority. If Jews are no longer considered a race, how are they self-defined? So there are other words that have come to be used. One is the notion of people. The other is ethnicity or an ethnos. The question that, that I have is, does ethnicity as a substitute category for race actually solve the problem of race? Or in a certain sense, is it just using a category that, um, that does not have the negative connotations um, that race has? Now, it's true that obviously Jews have become victims because of race, but Jews have also become victims because of religion. So it's not the racialization of the Jew that is the emergence of anti-Jewishness, but the racialization of the Jew is one particular iteration of that. It's interesting to note that the Jews stopped using the, racial, the, the term race to self-define in the 1930s, obviously I said because of the way that the Nazis racialized Jewishness, but the concept of biological determinism which is a racial category, generally was abandoned by the Jews, not because they felt that it was wrong necessarily, but because it didn't really serve their needs for the most part. The needs of the Jews in Europe before, certainly before the, the, the turn of the 20th century and even a little bit afterwards was normalization through emancipation, which was a sense of Jewish inclusion. 
So obviously, if the Jews are trying to be included in a society, they don't want to see themselves as racially other. Which then takes us back to the question of Zionism, where Zionism is viewed as an alternative marker of identity for Jews in the wake of what Zionists believed was the failure of emancipation to integrate the Jews, to include the Jews in European society. So in that case, the concept of difference was not something that was um, a disadvantage, but actually something that was an advantage. And since Zionism begins as a secular movement, religion could no longer be that marker of difference. So in many cases, the question of race comes into play in some, in some form. So in all of this, I think it's important to know that context matters a great deal. So in the course of these lectures, I want to think, I want to speak of three different theaters, the European theater and the role of race among European Jews, the United States theater, that is the role of race for American Jews, which is very different because obviously the question of anti-blackness and racism and the what the white the black and white divide that defines America defines America as a country comes into play and where Jews position themselves is going to be very important and Israel Israel of course is a very different situation um, where in a certain way the accusations of racism in Israel for the most part are not toward the Jews but about the Jews that is questions of racism against Arab populations and so on. So the question, and, and that becomes in a certain way um, marked by the 1987 Supreme Court racism law, which was the law that removed Mayor Kahana's party from the Knesset because of Kahana's racism against Arabs. That becomes in a certain sense the defining marker. Now, there's something really missing here that I wanna note. And that is the global South, South America, Australia, South Africa, that in a sense, there are other dimensions to the Jewish diaspora and, and uh, Santiago Slobodki's Decolonizing Judaism for people who haven't read it, I highly recommend it. Um, Santiago has really taught me and taught us the very distinctive quality of the South American context on, in, in many, many ways, and also on the question of race. So I do apologize that this, you know, this series of lectures cannot include the global South. It's just something I, I, I don't think I know, I, I know sufficiently about, but um, I think it's something that has to be considered. So I don't want to, I don't want to suggest that, that the, the situation is just a kind of triangle between Europe, the United States and Israel. So if we talk about Europe, to start, just more generally, the issue of race in Europe and the construction of race in Europe, and this is something that I want to talk about um, in the first lecture, and uh, we're going to use uh, J. Cameron Carter's fantastic book, Race, a Theological Approach, where his second chapter deals with the ways in which Europeans constructed race and blackness actually from the Jew. So that in a sense, Jew, the Jew becomes the object of the very discussion of race in Europe that constructs the notion of blackness that then gets transported to the United States. In the United States, the situation is different because the United States is built on a white supremacist foundation, and I use that term intentionally, that it is not simply about whiteness and blackness, but it is about whiteness and anti-blackness. Now you could say, of course, there are more than, uh, there are more groups of, than not, there are more groups of non-whites than blacks in America, but it's interesting, it's an interesting anecdote here that in fact, in the Jim Crow South, Chinese citizens of America were considered black and went to black segregated schools. So in a certain sense, the non, the Asian population in the South, in the Jim Crow South 
was a population that was considered racially other and yet put into the category of blackness such that they were part of that segregated segment of society. The question then becomes, where does the Jew situate herself in that white-black dichotomy? And this is a, 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 a question that has been studied extensively by a number of people. I find the most salient and comprehensive, the book, The Price of Whiteness by Eric Goldstein, who really goes historically from colonial America up to the post-civil rights era on where Jews situated themselves and positioned themselves in regards to their whiteness. And it fluctuates geographically and in terms of, of time, over periods of time, where Jews identified as white, identified as non-white, identified as white, identified as non-white, and so on and so forth and so on as we go on and on throughout the history of the United States. Jews were, from the perspective of the um, United States government, considered white. The example that I often bring is that in Johnson, in President Johnson's Great Society legislation that created the category of the ethnic minority for the purposes of affirmative action and other kinds of goods and resources that would be available to those non-white ethnic minorities, Jews were not on that list. By the 1960s, by the time of the Great Society, Jews were, for purposes of legislation, considered to be white. Now, what that means and the anxiety of whiteness is something that's come up in recent, in our recent history, in terms of Black Lives Matter, in terms of different other kinds of progressive causes, uh, the relationship between Jews' whiteness and Jews' uh, participation in non-white, particularly African-American uh, social movements from civil rights to Black Lives Matter to Black nationalism. We'll talk about that. I'll go through the other courses when I go through the other lectures. Now, the other thing that I want to, to talk about um, now, which I'm, again, we're going to talk about throughout, is the question of, um, of racism and what racism actually means. And here, in a way, I think that one of the things that becomes important is to situate racism within the hierarchies of power structures. So back in the 1960s, with the emergence of black nationalism, there was the case of what was called then black racism. That is, um, whether the black nationalist movement was a racist movement. There was an interesting essay about that, which we're going to see uh, by O. Rab, a Jewish sociologist. But I think the more, for the more salient point for our purposes now is what James Baldwin said about that. And Jade Baldwin's comment was somewhat tongue in cheek but I think is worth considering when we talk about racism in relationship to anti-Semitism also, and also racism in Israel, frankly. And that is, Baldwin says as follows, everybody hates everybody. The only thing that matters is power. Now, what Baldwin meant by that, what Baldwin meant by that was that Racism is not about a negative feeling that one group has towards another group. Because if that was the case, then everybody's racist against everybody else. Racism is disadvantaging through political, cultural, economic power that group that you don't like. The book, by the way, um, that I mentioned before is Eric Goldstein's The Price of Whiteness. 
So in that case, according to Baldwin, blacks can't be racists because blacks don't, even though blacks might not like whites, they don't really have any power to disadvantage whites. Where Baldwin said, I don't care if, if Barry Goldwater, right? This is back in the 60s, right? I don't care if Barry Goldwater hates me, but I do care that he can prevent me from getting a job. And I think what we'll talk about when we talk about racism in this regard, especially in relationship to anti-Semitism, is how that observation by Baldwin functions as well. That is to say that there are people in America who are who don't like Jews. Right. Earl Rabb calls that folk anti-Semitism, and we'll talk more about that in a, one of his lectures. But that same person who doesn't like Jews would be unequivocally opposed to legislation that would prevent Jews from voting, from resources, from educational opportunities. And for the most part, Rab is saying that's what most anti-Semitism is in America. Now, when we move into when we move into talking about anti-Semitism more specifically in the in the last lecture, we'll talk about the relationship between folk anti-Semitism and political anti-Semitism, and then, of course, the relationship between anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism. Now, this all is actually a party to this racial conversation, because although Jews still may consider themselves, or although Jews may consider themselves white, they are certainly considered white, not only by the legislature, but by other Americans or at least as my colleague uh, Rivka Schwartz says, white enough or white adjacent or some other terms, certainly white passing. How does that square with their identity as Jews, their identity as Americans? And also how does that square with their relationship to Zionism? which we'll also have to talk about a little bit. So in a sense, what I'd like to do is, you know, I'm, I'm just throwing these out. I know it's very schematic and I want to leave time for questions. Um, I want to tell you, and this is my sales pitch. I want to tell you the four lectures and, and how they will kind of fit together. The first lecture, we're going to address the question, are Jews a race, which will introduce the notion of whiteness. We'll talk about it through Carter's um, through Carter's book, um, Theology, uh, I'm sorry, a race, a, theolo a theology, theological approach. The second, um, the second lecture is going to focus specifically on the question, are Jews white? Which will get at uh, specifically the American question. The first lecture, by the way, is going to speak a little bit more about the European context in the 19th century. The third lecture we're going to, is going to be Jews, Civil Rights, and Black Power. And that is the way in which Jews in post-war America were able to negotiate and navigate the complex waters of their relationship to their whiteness, their relationship and commitment to civil rights on the one hand. And I think there's a big difference between Jews in the North and Jews in the South. And the rise of Black Power. And here, you know, one of the one of the studies, recent studies, um, uh, that maybe the admin can put on is Mark Dollinger's book, um, Jewish Politics. I think it's called Jewish Politics: Black Power. That, in fact, Jews had a complicated relationship with Black Power. Black Power had a complicated relationship with Jews. And I think this is important for us not only historically, but I think it extends to the Black Lives Matter movement and the conversation among American Jews about whether they should join the Black Lives Matter movement, which is a multi-ethnic movement as opposed to the Black National movement, which wasn't a multi-ethnic movement.
And the fourth lecture, we're going to talk about anti-blackness and anti-Semitism. And here I'm going to kind of speak a little bit more about the, the project that I'm working on that is looking at contemporary Jewish writing on anti-Semitism through the lens of critical race theory, to look at the way in which critical race theory theorists, Afro-pessimists, and others understood this notion of blackness and anti-blackness, and the way in which theorizing questions of anti-blackness can be used to help us better theorize the notion of anti-Semitism. Not to point out anti-Semitism, not to define anti-Semitism the way it is in the IHRA document or in the Nexus document or in the JDA document, the Jerusalem uh, document of anti-Semitism, right? Those are kind of working papers for defining what is anti-Semitism. In, term, in an objective sense, what I'm interested more is theorizing about anti-Semitism from a critical race theory perspective. So that's going to be kind of the experimental lecture where I start to kind of think about with you and share with you some of my ideas about that. So I, I do want to I do want to stop here and I want to um, invite you all to enroll in the lectures, but I also want to open this up to some questions. Uh, because I hope some of the things I said at least evoked some kind of um, of curiosity. So how are we going to work the questions and, and, and answers? We've got the question and answer section, which everyone's very welcome to use. And you can also put your questions in the chat. Uh -huh. Um, so let me let me uh, begin by one question. And please, uh, this is an anonymous attendee. And um, Please put some questions in that you might have. So the question is, can you talk about Sephardic Jews in general? But today's um, descendants of crypto Jews in particular reclaiming their Jewish ancestry via documenting their family lineage, a.k.a. genealogy. It's a fabulous question, and, and we will actually talk about it. So, of course, the issue of Jews and whiteness always you know, plays into the idea of the Mizrahi Jewish community. In other words, there are many Jews who are... Um, who are non-white, and how does that play into the question of, uh, of, of Jews and whiteness in America? And, and I would just, you know, briefly, very, very briefly, and, and it deserves much more unpacking than I can give here, that I think this is a distinction by saying not all Jews are white, but American Jews are white. That is, a, as a collective, they are a collective of within the category of whiteness, even though individual Jews may not consider themselves white and may not be white. And I think that distinction, although it may be offensive, I don't mean it to be offensive, but I'm trying to analytically understand the, the categorization of the Jews as a group, even though some individuals in that group may not fit that categorization. On the question of crypto Jews, there's some fabulous literature on this, especially crypto Jews in Mexico, crypto Jews in New Mexico and Arizona, people who are reclaiming their Jewish ancestry. I mean, there are two there are two basic possibilities here. On the one hand, proving ancestry of the Jewish exiles from Spain, either in Mexico, in many cases in Latin America or other parts of South America. And then there are um, the, the other case, and the other case with an interesting example, as some of you might remember in, I think, 2016, of, um, of AOC, who was giving a talk in a synagogue, Ocasio-Cortez, Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez, who was giving a talk in a synagogue, and it was on Hanukkah, and she mentioned that she she her family tradition is that they come from Jewish heritage. Now a lot of there was an article in the Forward and maybe an article in Jewish Week. I don't remember. There was a lot of there was a lot of conversation about this. Oh, AOC is claiming that she's a Jew and so on and so forth. I think it's very interesting to distinguish. She was not claiming that she was a Jew. She was claiming that she came from Jewish heritage, and I think there's a big difference. So she argued that her family had a tradition that they were descended from exilic Jews in Spain obviously had come to Puerto Rico or come to the Caribbean or wherever they came and intermarried for many, many, many generations, but maybe held on to some kind of Jewish, you know, traditions or something, you know, lighting candles or 
whatever, not eating bread on Passover, whatever it is, because we, we've heard many of these stories. So I think I think there are two distinctions. There are those people who are claiming to actually be Jews. And then there's a, there are people who are claiming to be descended from Jews. Not to claim that they should now be part of the Jewish community and included in the Jewish people, but that that heritage itself means something to them, something significant to them, which is what AOC was saying. And the case of the crypto Jews and the reclaiming of their Jewish ancestry through documenting the family lineages is an interesting one. And this also raises another issue which we have to deal with, which is, of course, the genealogical and genetic aspect to all this. That's that there has you know become so important and so significant with the genome project and people being able to quote prove their Jewishness in some way. But what does that actually mean? Is that then a racial distinction? Or is the genome something that is not necessarily meant to be a racial one? So thank you for that question. Um Here's another question from, from April Rosenblum. Uh, do you know of any studies that draw connections between Spanish history and the concept of limpieza de sangre and the early formation of anti-Black racism? Again, there's a lot of stuff that's been written on that. Um, the limpieza de sangre is, of course, this, this pure blood theory that emerged in Christian Spain. We normally think that Christianity, in a sense, was not a kind of racialized religion, right? That it was a universal religion, it was a global religion, anyone can become Christian. But in Spain, you had this pure blood theory that was directed against what were then called new Christians or conversos. That is, Jews who converted to Christianity were somehow being marginalized because they didn't have pure Christian blood. Now, the relationship between that and early formations of anti-Black racism, I will say that Gerald Horn in his book, The Dawning of the Apocalypse, does talk about that. And as well, it's worth looking at Jonathan Shorish's book, only I don't have it up on my screen and I don't remember the title of it now, which talks about um, Jews in the, um, uh, in the slave trade. Now, this is actually a, an important question since April, since you raised this, and then I want to turn to, to Tamar's question. There's a lot of talk about, um, a lot of talk about Jews in the slave trade and we're Jews in the slave trade. And that's anti-Semitic to talk about Jews being the slave trade. What, you know, it's, this is not to say that something that's historically true can be used for anti-Semitic purposes. But I think we have to distinguish between that which is historically true and that which is um, mythologized out of a historical context for, for anti-Semitic purposes. Historically, Jews were involved in the slave trade in all kinds of ways. Gerald Horn shows it, Jonathan Shorish shows it, many other people show it in a particular kinds of ways in Spain, in Portugal, in parts of North Africa, right? And that was because in a certain sense, Jews were, that, that, was, that was, you know, for a period of time in the 16th century, that was one of the main European industries. And that's just, the, you know, the Jews played a significant role in that. How that relates to um, anti-Black racism, Horn does touch on in his book, because it turns out that some of the important slave traders in the New World were Jewish conversos, that is Jewish New Christians, who traveled from Spain and Portugal to what, what is now Mexico and the United States, and were part of that system. And also, even though they were conversos, in many cases, they continued to identify in some way as Jews. Um, I wanted to look at something in the chat before I go to Nicole's question um, that Tamar asked. Only I don't see it now. Um, I don't know. Tamar, was it in the Q&A or... Oh, it was in the chat. Tamar asks about ethnicity. How does ethnicity fit oh, in? Oh, how does this fit in? How do you assume what you make ethnicity in general in regard to Jews? Fascinating question. And, and, and there isn't a clear answer to that because it's really about 
the relationship between ethnos and genos that goes back to antiquity, questions about whether ethnicity is a substitute category because race is no longer a le legitimate term, or whether ethnicity talks about some other kind of distinctiveness that is not racially determined. Now you have, for example, you know, in America, groups that are called, considered white ethnics. And these white ethnic groups are ethnically distinct communities, but yet their distinction is not racial, but rather oriented toward another set of, of criteria. So I think there, there are, there's a number of ways of answering this, but one of the ways is to say is how is ethnicity used and does why does ethnicity become the operative term of Jews defining themselves precisely when the category of race ceases to function that way. And in a certain way, that's one of the things I asked, I, I asked as a question in the beginning was, does ethnicity solve the race problem? And I'm not really clear what it is, but we'll have an opportunity certainly to talk about it. Um, uh, somebody asked a question about the genetic test, only I have to go up on the chat to get to it. Um, uh, yes, so the question received before the lecture, if Jews are not a race, why does the genetic test come with the result 100% Jewish? Yes, no, I think, I, think it's, I, think it's a, I think it's a good question. And I think that um, the idea of biological determinism, which was a racial category back in the 19th century, that I said the, the Jews largely abandoned because it didn't serve their purposes, once you have the genome pro project, it complicates things because I think one of the things that that the genome project sh is showing is the multi ethnicity or multi raciality of most people. That in fact, over the course of human civilization, people were always marrying other people. They were always having children with other groups, and so everybody's makeup is in a certain sense multi ethnic and multi racial. Now the question is how much to one side or how much to the other side that's you know and, and then and then how does one how how does one then identify in terms of does one identify as being black does one identify as being white and this is a question that children of multiracial marriages specifically obama had to address a white mother and a black father right does one uh, does one identify as being black and does one identify as being as white now there were certain you know the one drop rule in america in terms of defining whiteness and blackness was something that was le a legislation in the early part in the middle part of the 20th century but no longer exists so a person that is multiracial can really identify any way they want and I think that in a certain way, that becomes the case with Jewishness too. And this then brings up the question of matrilineal versus patrilineal descent in terms of identifying Jews. An interesting case study of this is, of course, John Asaf and Emma Emhoff, who are both patrilineal Jews. One of them, John Asaf, identifies as a Jew, and one of them, Emma Emhoff, does not identify as a Jew. Um, as a master student in the in the UK, I'm asking. I'm just reading Nicole Friedman's question. Freeman, I'm sorry. As a master student in the UK, focusing specifically on the intersectionality of Black Jews, what do you think the key texts would be to analyze on Jews as a race? A good question. Again, you know, I can. If you want to send me an email, I can talk about that. Um, uh, there are a number of different uh, a, a different books that deal with that question specifically about Black Jews and also JFRAG, which is an organization of Jews of color, has uh, a lot of literature on that as well. So we can we can talk about that. Elliot, um, what are your thoughts on the question of pre-modern treatments of groups linked character to kinship, Amalek or Canaanites in the Bible as a sort of proto-racism or proto-racial categories? You know, obviously in, 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 the, in, the, in, the, in the time of the Bible, in the ancient world, people, I, I don't think that we can call it proto-racism. It really, it really functions more in terms of tribalism and kinship or, um, uh, you know, tribalism as a familial category. And maybe the Israelites also define themselves as, um, as a familial category. Uh, it, it, again, I think that the pro, you know, we, we enter into the problem of anachronism, of course, and taking the category of race, which is not a category that the ancient world really, that really functioned in the ancient world. Sure, it's sure, certainly not the way it functions today. 
But whether we can take the category that we use today, or certainly was used in the 19th century, and, and retroject it back to the ancient world, and, and without trying to make an equivalence of saying, oh yeah, these are racial categories, to say, is the, is the racial does the racial category itself tell us something about the way in which ancient societies construct the difference? So that's, that would be a, the, the short answer to that, Elliot. Thanks for the question. Any other questions or comments, either in the chat or in the, either in the chat or in the, um, I'm just, I'm just trying to look to see if there's something that I didn't answer. Um, one thing that I will also add is, um, to, to look at or consider the extent to which, or if perhaps it's worth it to consider the reinstitution, not reconstitution, or I should, let's say it a different way. Um, Jews abandoned race because of the Nazis primarily as a category. Is there a time when that episode will be far enough in the past that race can again become a category that Jews can think with. Because I think that Jews are still thinking with race, because I think in America for sure, you cannot only, you cannot but think in racial categories. And I think we've seen that in terms of everything that's been going on in the last five or six years. So a question from James, uh, from James Wald, Jews and genetic tests, which again, this is something that I'd love to hear more about. I mean, I've read a bunch of stuff, but I certainly don't feel myself at all an expert on this issue, but it's an important one. Someone of Ashkenazi ancestry can readily be distinguished as such with almost absolute certainty on the basis of genetic tests. When compared with both neighboring non-Jewish populations, Polish Ukrainian and other Jewish populations, the explanation is very simple. The genetic test shows patterns of ancestry, Ashkenazi Jews for centuries, married almost exclusively through their own community, experienced various, um, one second, demographic crises, both of which accentuate genetic homogeneity. The Jews stand out on this basis as uh, what we call genetic genetic isolate. I mean, I, I, again, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not up on the science here, but I, I think from a historical perspective, um, we know that, um, there were certain periods of time when Jews married Jews primarily because they were forbidden to marry non-Jews. Um, but uh, David Nuremberg, for example, in his book on communities of violence of Jews, Christians, and Muslims in medieval Spain shows that there was a fair amount of intermarriage in medieval Spain um, among Jews, Christians, and Muslims. So in generally, the general rule of thumb is um, when Jews could marry, when Jews could marry non-Jews, they usually did. Obviously not in great numbers, certainly not in the numbers that we have in America, but the idea that somehow, and this is, this is ironically, right? This is how we're used to Chamberlain's theory, right? That Jews didn't intermarry, therefore they're a superior race. Therefore we have to exclude them from, from our society because they're gonna basically dominate us. I think that that myth that Jews were largely endogamous throughout history, certainly in late antiquity, is simply hard to, to imagine. I mean, if we want to go back to biblical times and the, the return of the Jews from the exile of Babylonia back to the land of Israel, you only have to look at Ezra and Nehemiah to see that the first thing that Ezra says to the Jews who remained in the land of Israel was separate from your non-Jewish wives, right? So obviously, um, that's in like Ezra 9, Ezra 8, Ezra 9, Ezra 10. So obviously, uh, there was a fair amount of intermarriage among Jews who remained in the land of Israel during the first exile. How much that continued throughout, uh, throughout history, Jewish history and antiquity and late antiquity is a, is a debate among scholars. But I, I just think, I, I just want to kind of, 
a poke a hole, or I shouldn't say this. I should. I want to really question whether the the endogamous nature of the Jews throughout history is really historically verifiable. Now, how that plays out into genetics, I just don't know enough about the science to to to, to know how you can make those kinds of determinations. Thanks for that question. Um, an anonymous question, does the concept of a Jewish race discount self-identification, such as a practice in Catholic, but was documented Jewish ancestry when broken by a conversion and rely solely on lineage and DNA? It's an interesting question. That's actually a very interesting question. Um, and this really raises another set of issues, which is, um, is the determination of the Jew exclusively a determination of the Jewish body or not? Can a Jew become a non-Jew? What is the status of conversion out of Judaism to another religion in regard, in relationship to the Jewishness of that person? So that would a Jewish race kind of decount that kind of self-identification. Now, generally speaking, the practical wisdom is that the Jew cannot become a non-Jew. The Jew can become an apostate Jew, but they can't become a non-Jew. Now, this is not completely clear. Maimonides, for example, um, makes a claim that a Jew who converts to another religion is no longer a part of the Jewish people. That doesn't mean they couldn't come back if they revert back to Judaism. One of the interesting cases here is the case of Brother Daniel Osmold Rufusen, who was a Polish Jew who converts to Christianity and becomes a Benedictine monk, and then tries in 1959 to immigrate to Israel under the law of return, and his 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 uh, request to immigrate is denied and it goes to the Supreme Court and in 1961 the brother Daniel case is the case that determines the who was a Jew case in Israel and interestingly enough the the secular Israeli authorities made the argument that because he had become part of another religion he could no longer immigrate under the law of return whereas the Israeli rabbinate made the claim that his conversion does not erase his Jewishness and he should be able to immigrate under the law of return as it turned out he was denied entry under the law of the return he was admitted into Israel as one of the righteous Gentiles because he had saved hundreds and hundreds of Jewish lives. He basically saved the Warsaw. He, he saved the Mir ghetto from uh, from liquidation. It's kind of a long story. And he lived in a monastery, um, the St. Marius, Saint Marius Monastery in Haifa uh, for the rest of his life. So that's a, that's a, that's a very good point. Um, so I, I want to read James's response because I think it's, 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 it's good. He says, I'm saying, what I'm saying is that, um, what I'm saying is that uh, the genetic tests show the makeup ancestry of stretching back for centuries, a generalization certainly was an admixture. It's just ancestry. Jews and identity are cultural and personal. Race is a social construct of fiction. That's all I meant. And that's a really good point, right? Uh, now, I think you bring up a really good, an, another point, which I, I do want to, I do want to, uh, to talk about, and that is the way in which, the way in which, um, in today's discourse, race itself might no longer be considered a scientific or an objective category the way it was in the nineteenth century. That race itself is construction, and if we say that race itself is a constructed category, then what do we make of the Jew, right? What do we make of race in general? But what do we make of the Jew? Now, it's not to say that blackness, for example, is a constructed category, but that race itself as a definition of blackness is considered to be constructed rather than objective. So how would the Jew fit into that? And I think one of the fascinating things about this topic is the way in which um, looking at the Jewish experience from the, from the perspective of race opens up a whole other set of questions and issues uh, 
that really speak very directly to 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 to, to notions of identity, right? Um, and Jewishness, and religiosity, and nationalism, and all of these kinds of things, because we no longer think of nationalism as a racial category, but in the 19th century they did, right? So when nationalism was being constructed in the 19th century, race mattered a great deal. In our society, supposedly, race doesn't matter. Now, of course, it matters because there's prejudice and bigotry, but there is a kind of constitutional pr protection against racist or racialist um, activity. This then raises questions regarding Israel. How do we understand Israel as an ethno-national state, which it is by calling it a Jewish state, we're saying it is an ethno-national state. What is the relationship between that and, and race? And one other example, which we'll talk about a little bit more, is um, in the 1970s, the emergence of the Israeli Black Panthers, which was a group of Mizrahi Jews who were fighting against the Ashkenazi elite government in order to gain rights and accesses and resources and you know uh, discrimination against Mizrahi Jews and so on, who actually showed solidarity with the Arab population because they considered themselves racially the same as the Arabs, except that they were Jews and the Arabs were Muslims. So that raises a whole other set of, of issues on the Israeli front, which is a very difficult and a very complicated story. So I think I, I've, you know, we got to seven o'clock and I don't want to take any of, of any of your time. Um, so that's the kinds of things we're going to talk about. And, uh, and I hope I was able to kind of just give a, a thumbnail sketch of the issues and problems. And, and, and I'm hoping that it's going to be uh, kind of an interactive uh, series of meetings where we'll be able to read some text together and we'll be able to talk these things through and, and see where we go. Thank you very much, Shaul. I just wanted to reiterate that we begin on April 29th and the lectures happen once a week on Thursdays. Uh, well, you can enroll using our website, www.bodelandsopenschool.org. And you're very welcome to ask further questions by emailing Shaul or me at admin uh, email. I'll pass them on to the lecturer. Thank you, everyone. I mean, I also want, I just want to say one thing is that, that, that we're going, I'm going to try to be able to, hopefully we'll figure out a way of mailing out to the people who enroll some material to read before. Of course, yeah, we'll do this before the sessions. Yes. Okay. okay, thank you all. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you for thank you for your time.